So in chapter six, we're going to talk about inventory. And we kind of talked about some idea of um, inventory on the financial statement in chapter five. But in chapter six, we're going to get into detail as to the specifics of inventory, mainly how we're going to determine the quantities of various inventory, how we determine what is sold first or what is sold last. Inventory can come in at different costs. Do we have a method where what came in first goes out first, also called FIFO, first in, first out? Is our costing that the items that we purchased um, later get brought out first from a costing standpoint, not necessarily from an inventory standpoint, which is called LIFO, or do we average all these costs throughout the time? We're going to talk about various types of um, inventory and how fast inventory turns over. Sometimes, depending on the company, inventory can turn over every seven days. Depending on what type of industry it is, inventory might turn over every two months. There's benefits with turning your inventory over faster because you, it, it, um, the cost isn't as great as you make the products they're sold. With different types of products, such as jewelry, you might have certain types of jewelry sitting in inventory for a long time. So we're going to talk about various um, aspects as it relates to inventory. Now, in the chapter we dealt with um, for chapter five, we mainly discussed a merchandising company like Target, like Macy's, that purchased the inventory or the merchandise to resell. There are also companies that manufacture goods like 3M. Can you think of another industry that might manufacture products? Who else manufactures? Boeing, Caterpillar, Toro, John Deere. Who else? Toshiba. Toshiba. Ford, GMC. A lot of manufacturing. What's happening with the manufacturing sector in the United States right now? It's going away. Why is it going away? Cheap labor. Cheap labor. So we're seeing a trend of exporting a lot of our manufacturing. It's, it's being done overseas. Personally, I think, I mean, I, I don't think it's going to come back, but I do think we're going to see a turnaround in, in that our quality isn't always what we would like it to be. But it'll be interesting to see ultimately what unfolds because manufacturing is a big piece of our economy, isn't it? And we're losing that, that work. So with a manufacturing company, we're, we've got inventory, but we're dealing with different kinds of inventory. Instead of just the pure merchandise, we're dealing with all the various materials to make the inventory. So we're going to talk about, in a manufacturing company, the breakdown of cost of goods sold in inventory as it relates to manufacturing. The one thing this um, slide says that's really important, inventory, no matter what type of company, is a current asset. What else do we know is a current asset? Cash. What else? Accounts receivable. Inventory is also a current asset. So if you get a question on an exam saying, where would inventory um, fall in the balance sheet? What would you say? Current asset. Now let me see what this big hiccup is. We're not going to worry about that right now. So physical inventory can um, be accounted for in two methods, the periodic system and the perpetual. With the perpetual system, I think we 
talked about this um, previously, but in a perpetual system, there's usually a computer that keeps track of all inventory on hand all the time. Under a periodic system, there's a physical count that is usually done at the end of a quarter or for sure at the end of the fiscal period or fiscal year. Why would we do both? Oftentimes, even though there's a perpetual system, there will always still be a periodic count of the goods. Why do we do that? Exactly. We still need to count just to ensure that what we're showing on our computer records is, in fact, the actual count. Things get lifted. Things get um, potentially lost. Things get, um, they're no good. They're broken. And so we need to do both. When we take a physical count, usually this happens when nobody's in the store. So the store gets closed down, and they literally count each item on hand. Have any of you guys been responsible or part of doing an inventory? Tell me about it. What did you guys do? It sucks. It sucks. Tell me about how it sucks. Um. Well, where were you working? A grocery store. So after the store closed, you um, basically had to count each item and each specific, and then um, keep track of it. Well, in a grocery store, you're dealing with a lot of quantity. Okay. Um, anyone else done a physical count on inventory? Tell me what you did. Isn't that amazing? It's kind of crazy. Anyone else? Yes. And what would you count at McDonald's? The uh, most containers. The containers. That never closes. I've seen how you can tell that they're doing counts. Um, they have to do it intermittently. So they might take a certain area and do a count on it. Um, again, sometimes it's, an, an, it's not maybe um, as accurate because people are still shopping all the time. Walmart does close sometimes, yeah, don't they? Usually they're open, but there are times they're closed. But generally speaking, with companies, it's a good question, with companies that are open 24-7, they're going to do their inventory count um, intermittently. So they'll do certain areas of it. And, you know, they might have a little guessing game as it relates to people taking them off the shelves, but they're generally going to do it when it's not crowded in the store. Um, so usually inventory physical counts are taken at the end of the period. Now, inventory are those items that you're going to use to either resell or those goods you put into making products. But who owns those goods? That's a really important piece in this chapter is when does the title to goods change hands? So sometimes there are goods that you might own but haven't been received yet. And then there are possibly goods you've sold but you've not delivered them yet. So we're going to really spend time in this chapter talking about when does title transfer from the buyer to the seller, okay? Or the seller to the buyer. Goods in transit should be included in the inventory of the company that has legal title to the goods. Legal title is determined by the terms of the sale. So here we're going to talk about this terms of the sale. Have any of you purchase goods where the the um, the seller pays for the shipment to your place so there are generally um, 
a couple ways in which you determine when the actual goods transfer from the seller to the buyer. There's one called FOB, or free on board to the shipping point. What this means, free on board to the shipping point is the seller is has sold goods and they're putting them on the UPS truck. So at that time, free on board to the shipping point, ownership of those goods becomes the buyer's goods when the UPS truck accepts the goods from the seller. So the other day, I purchased all these new Tyler candles, 42 pounds of candles. I know my husband's going to die when I bring him home tonight. I used to have a store in Red Wing that sold them, and the, that's gone out of business, so I have another store. I buy them, and I have them delivered. And so I am responsible for shipping, although if you spend more than a certain amount, they waive it. But when the UPS truck picks up those goods from the old Prague Market down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, they become my um, responsibility. I own them at that time. What happens if UPS loses them? I'll have to take that up with UPS, won't I? Old Preg's out of the deal. They sold them to me and their responsibility is done the minute they hit that UPS truck. Make sense? Then there's also a time when the, the the sale transaction says FOB destination, free on board to the destination. Here, ownership of the goods remains with the seller until the goods reach the buyer. So let's say, um, I'm trying to think of an example. We, my husband is doing a bunch of retiling, so we're, we're purchasing tile on crates, you know, so these crates get shipped, dropped off at our house, okay? So if the, the situation is that Builders Direct, who we're buying them from, pays for the shipping, and part of the terms of the shipping is that free on board to destination, Technically, in this area, free on board to destination means the um, sh trucking company in Red Wing. It's not necessarily to our house. It's a little confusing. But what that means is the title doesn't transfer from the, or the goods transfer to us once they hit that trucking company's warehouse. So if something happens to those goods prior to getting to that trucking company's warehouse, they're responsible for them. Once that trucking company has those goods, we're responsible for them. So if there's damage, if there's loss, we will take the ownership of it. Know the words FOB, shipping point, FOB, destination. When does title pass? Really important to know for purposes of what do you claim in your inventory? Until you actually sell those goods, they're part of your, your um, inventory. Once they transfer hands, now it's a cost of goods sold. Now the sale has taken place. Do you guys understand what I'm talking about? Goods in transit should be included in the inventory of the buyer when A, the public carrier accepts the goods from the seller, B, the goods reach the buyer, C, the terms of trade are FOB destination, or D, the terms of sale are FOB shipping point. What do you think? Thank you. Free on board to the shipping point, and then at that time, the buyer's responsible. So. What happens when we have consigned goods? Does anyone know what a consigned good is? Have any of you guys gone to furniture stores where there's um, various furniture, but it's held on consignment? They don't really own it. They're kind of um, putting it in their, um, their store, and someone else can buy it, and they take a cut of it. Consigned goods are really not goods of the, the seller. They're goods of a third party. 
to hold the goods of other parties and to try to sell the goods for them for a fee but without taking ownership are consigned goods. So the store truly doesn't own those goods. They're only providing a service to link a buyer and a seller. Does that make sense? Many car, boat, and antique dealers sell goods on consignment. Why do they sell goods on consignment and they don't actually buy the goods? It's cheaper. It's cheaper. Does that make sense? They're going to get a fee for their service they're doing. It's cheaper. It keeps their inventory down. Let's look at this problem. Has been company completed its inventory count. It arrived at a total inventory value of, of 200,000. You've been given the information listed below. Discuss how this information affects the reported cost of inventory. So has been included in the inventory goods held on consignment for Falls Company costing 15,000. So what they're saying is this store included an extra 15,000 in inventory that really wasn't theirs. They were on consignment. So does that overstate inventory or understate inventory? It overstates inventory. Next, the company did not include in the count purchase goods of 10,000 which were in transit, FOB shipping point. So should they have included those goods? They should have included them, but they didn't. That $10,000, did that overstate inventory or understate inventory? Under Understated inventory. Last, excuse me, the company did not include in the count inventory that had been sold with a cost of $12,000, which was in transit, FOB shipping point. Should they have? The company did not include in the count inventory that had been sold with a cost of $12,000, which was in transit. So probably what they're saying is it didn't get to the shipping point yet. If, if the $12,000 um, already hit the shipping point, then they did it right. But if it had not hit the shipping point at that time, then they understated inventory. Yes, did you have a question? The company did not include in the count purchased goods. I was just wondering if, they, if that meant they sold goods or they had bought goods and had to They purchased goods. Mm -hmm. So they purchased goods that were getting to their store. Mm -hmm. But the term FOB shipping point meant the title passed to those goods once they hit the shipping point. And so which were in transit makes me think that it means they were in route. So that should have been included in those goods. Item three was treated correctly. In other words, FOB shipping point means the inventory count, it should be included until it hits that shipping point, and then after that, it's sold. It's not part of their inventory anymore. Does that make sense? Yes? Um. Mm. Well, one thing I do want to mention is, how many of you guys remember Petters, the Petters Warehouse? No? He was a local businessman, and he supported Teen Challenge. I mean, he really had some good causes, but he was a crook. And what he did, when he would um, go to um, do their inventory count at the year end, Technically, you'll learn if you take an auditing class that the auditors go alongside with people as they're doing an inventory count. And they would go into tons of warehouses. And in the warehouses, they were lined up boxes and boxes of TVs. Well, this one auditor thought, you know, I'm not just going to look at these boxes. I want to look inside of it and see if this box really has in it what it says. Guess what happened to those boxes? Take a wild guess. They were empty. They were empty. 
So what they were trying to show there that was a in inventory at the end of the year, which would mean make them look like they're worth something. Their assets, current assets had value. Those were empty boxes. What is the likelihood that an auditor would have done that? I mean, technically you're supposed to, but when you, you can only imagine when you're dealing with companies and you're dealing with multiple units, off-site storage units, do you really go in and look in boxes? Can you imagine? So if there's a will, there's a way <coughs> to be crooked. Okay, moving on. Um, I, I could tell you all kinds of stories, but we'll do that at another time. Inventory. How do we figure out the cost of inventory? Let's just say, let's keep it real simple. Let's just say that we have, what are we selling? We're selling um, iPads, okay? Oh, no, that's, we're selling crap. <laughs> Stop that. TVs. We have the new Samsung um, 60 inch flat screen, okay? And we purchased 10 of those initially, 10 quantity at roughly $450 a piece. Then we needed five more and we purchased those for $462 a piece, okay? Then we purchased 10 more at 500 a piece. You see how it's not always black and white? Which one of these did we sell? We sold six of them. Which ones did we sell? Awesome. So there's ways we determine what we sold and what's still on hand. FIFO means First in, first out. These six came from here. Generally a lower cost. So the, our inventory is going to be at a higher price if costs go up. And what our cost of goods show is that we sold the $450 items. That would be called FIFO. If we sold, sell based on LIFO, last in, first out, then six of these were sold for $500. That's what we're going to start talking about. This is where, guys, it can get tricky, but just think this through. Does that really mean a physical count that the last ones that came in were the first they left? No. You're just generally going to make sure the old models get sent out first. But from a costing standpoint, this is all just about money, okay? Think about strawberries. Are you going to sell the ones that just came in first? Heck no. You're going to get those strawberries that came in on the truck two days ago out first, right? So inventory, how do we account for it from a financial standpoint? It's going to include a lot of things to get that inventory in place. But the unit costs are going to be based on either FIFO, LIFO. We take an average cost or what if we're dealing with a diamond ring? It's not LIFO or FIFO. It's a specific item, specific identification. When we're dealing with unique items, we're not going to worry about FIFO and LIFO. They're going to have a specific cost associated with that unit. Automobiles are that way, aren't they? Airplanes are that way. What else might be that way? Houses. Probably certain types of machinery. That is specific for a, a tractor. We had this huge tractor come up to plow our yard. I'm sure those tractors have some unique items. You know, they, like an automobile you can uh, um, add on. What else? Are shoes treated that way? When I went to DSW to buy these shoes, there were 50 more just like this. A shoe is a shoe is a shoe, right? 
purses are that way. Maybe if I had a unique purse that was monogrammed in my letters and, well, even still, I don't think it works that way. So the unique items that are specifically, mainly like jewelry, um, what else, guys, help me? Airplanes, what else? What else could you purchase that might be unique to what your needs are? What? Hot air balloon? <laughs> Probably you're exactly right. <coughs> Hot air balloon is going to be specifically to your specifications that you need. Let's take a look at how this is going to work. Crivet's TV company purchases three identical 50-inch TVs on different dates at cost of 700, 750, and 800. During the year, Crivet sold two sets at $1,200 each. These facts are summarized below. You can see the purchases, one on February 3rd for $700, one on March 5th for $750, and then May 22nd for $800. And then on June 1st, they sold two of them, $1,200 each. How are we going to show which ones were sold? If Crivet sold the TVs it purchased on February 3rd and May 22nd, then its cost of goods sold would be the 700 and the 800. You see, the 700 and the 800. And its ending inventory is 750. 700 and 800, and then its ending inventory here would be 750. So depending which goods it sold, it's going to determine what we're showing in the cost of goods sold and what's left in inventory at the end of the period. Actual physical flow costing methods in which items still in inventory are specifically costed to arrive at the total cost of the ending inventory is specific identification. So basically, this is going to happen more when we're dealing with very unique items. The cost flow assumption does not mean that the physical flow is the same. So if you get a question that says, if the cost flow shows LIFO, last in are the first to, be, to leave, does that mean that we truly sell the last products? No. Just from a costing standpoint, that's how we're going to do it for the books. Okay? Have I lost anyone yet? Does it make sense? Let's take a look at this. Data for Houston Electronics Astro Condensers. We started the year with 100 units. They cost 10 bucks each. Then in April, we purchased 200 units at 11 bucks. In August, we purchased 300 units at 12 bucks. And then in November, we purchased 400 units at 13 bucks. So we now have 1,000 units available for sale. When we counted, we did our count at the end of the period, there were 450 units still left, which means we sold 550 units. Okay? So depending on which costing flow method we use will determine how we value this inventory. If we do what's called first in, first out, costs of the earliest goods purchased are the first to be put into cost of goods sold, it's FIFO. In this case, if we do that and we show we sold 550 units, under FIFO, we will have sold all of the 100, all of the 200, and 250 of the August 24th. Does that make sense? Any questions on this? Yes? Now, so as you can see here, when we look at this, our ending inventory is going to show the 400 units still on November 27th, and 50 units at 12 bucks here. 
This is ending inventory because FIFO means the goods we sold are the ones that came in first. So in figuring this out, our cost of goods sold is going to be the difference between all the cost minus what we show still sitting on the shelves at the end of the period. So if it's FIFO, that means the first goods were the first ones to be sold, which means what's left on the shelves are the last ones in. Any questions on that? Do you guys want to do a problem like this? Okay, let me just show you this and then we'll move on. So first in, first out means we started with a thousand bucks. Hundred we started the period with a thousand hundred shares at ten bucks, a hundred units at ten bucks. Then we added more. We added two hundred units at eleven bucks. Then we added more. Whoops. But when at the end of the period, this is what we still have on the shelves, which means the rest of it left. Okay. LIFO is the opposite. So if we deal with LIFO, which means the goods we sold were the last in, the first out, what would be left in our ending inventory are these goods up here. The, the, the cheaper goods. So in this case, if we have 450 goods still on our units, still on our shelves, we're going to take the earlier units to show that those are still on the shelves, which instead of the last number being 5,800, look at how our inventory is less under LIFO than it is under FIFO. Ultimately, it's going to end up the same, but how we determine which goods are sold is going to determine the profits we're making. Make sense? Because things don't always remain consistent and stable. Let's look at a problem, okay? The first problem is problem 6-1. What page is 6-1 on? 316. 316. So problem 6-1. Problem 6-1 shows Columbia Bank and Trust is considering giving Gallup Company a loan. Before doing so, it decides that further discussions with Gallup's accountant may be desirable. One area of particular concern is the inventory count which has a year in balance of $275,000. Discussions with the accountant reveal the following. Our job is to determine the correct inventory amount, okay? So we are going to start with showing the inventory is The inventory, ending inventory, physical count is supposed to be 275,000. Okay? Let's look at these. One says Gallup sold goods costing 55,000 to Basil Company, FOB Shipping Point on December 28th. The goods are not expected to reach Brazil until January 12th. The goods were not included in the physical inventory because they were not in the warehouse. Did they do it right? Let's think about it. The Gallup sold the goods costing 55000 to Brazil. Basically, the goods sh transfer hands at the shipping point. Where's the shipping point? Usually like the warehouse door, the, sh the door. The truck. The truck. So they did it right because the goods were sold on December 28th. It's going to take them 12, 14 days to reach them, but when does the, did the 
groups pass hands at the shipping point. They didn't include them in inventory, but they shouldn't have included them in inventory, should they? Does that make sense? So for this one particular situation with number one, no effect. Title passes to the purchaser upon shipment when terms are FOB shipping point. What if it would have said FOB destination? Then they should have included it, okay? But right now it says FOB shipping point. They shouldn't have included that. We're good, okay? Okay, the next one. The next one says, the physical count of the inventory did not include goods costing 95,000 that were shipped to Gallup FOB destination on 27, December 27th, and were still in transit at year end. The physical count of the inventory did not include goods costing 95000 that were shipped to Gallup FOB destination on December 27th and were still in transit at year end. Sounds like they should. The physical count of the inventory did not include. It does sound like the. No effect. No effect. Tyler's not transfer to Gallup into. Okay, Gallup is the one, good point, Gallup is the one that's getting the goods, okay? We're dealing with Gallup. Gallup is receiving goods, FOB destination, which means title will pass to Gallup when they get to Gallup's shipping point, or um, dock, shipping dock. So the person that they bought the goods from still has title to them, until they hit the shipping dock or the the warehouse dock so that is correct because Gallup's the one receiving those goods Gallup's not the one selling the goods they're receiving the goods okay so that one is correct because no effect title does not transfer to Gallup um, until the goods are received. Remember, this is a purchase. Okay? Okay? Next one. Gallup received goods costing 25000 on January 2nd. The goods were shipped, FOB shipping point, on December 26th. By Lynch Company. The goods were not included in the physical count. There we go. It, they should have been, shouldn't they? They messed this one up. They received goods on January 2nd, but they should have been included because it was FOB shipping point. So there we go. We finally say we add this to inventory. Title passed to Gallup when the goods were shipped. And that is how much? 25,000? Right? Next one. Whoops. Next one. Whoops. Gallup sold goods costing 51000 to Lamy of Canada, FOB destination, on December 30th. The goods were received in Canada on January 8th. They were not included in Gallup's physical inventory. Should they have been included? No. No. Because it was the year end. 
Well, the transaction wasn't completed until after the year. Get that, though, in order for it to count. What do you think? <laughs> They should have been included. I would agree with you. How many think they should have been included? How, th guys, this is how we learn, though. This is challenging. Does it make sense? That's why I like doing this stuff as a class. To figure this out on your own, it's challenging. Remember I told you this can be confusing? Okay? But at the end of the year, the goods hadn't been received yet. Yeah, so... Correct. So they should be included. They should be. They shouldn't be included. But it's Gallup's inventory that they're selling. It's Gallup's inventory. Gallup sold goods. You see, and guys, that's where it's tricky. You got to remember: Are they purchasing goods or are they selling goods? Okay. If they're purchasing goods, you would be right, Martin. But they're selling goods that are FOB destination. If they don't arrive at the, to the buyer until the next year, they should be included in the ending inventory. So let's look at that. The, the, if he, it, so if it arrived in that time, then, then you wouldn't include it? Correct. Okay. Add to inventory, title remains with Gallup until the purchaser receives the goods. And that was for how much? 51,000. Okay, now one more. Gallup received goods costing 42,000 on January 2nd. Gallup received goods. Can you tell they purchased these goods? Uh -huh. Gallup received goods costing 42000 on January 2nd that were shipped FOB destination on December 29th. The shipment was a rush order that was supposed to arrive December 31st. The purchase was included in the Indian inventory of 275. It should not have been included in the Indian inventory. Does everyone understand why? Since it was supposed to be FOB destination and they didn't get there till January 2nd, the title didn't pass until the next year. Subtract from ending inventory. The goods did not arrive prior to year end. The goods, therefore, cannot be included in the inventory. And that is a minus 42,000. What should our true inventory be, guys? We showed it to be 275. What should it really be? 309. 309? You're right. 309. Anybody have questions on this? Does that make sense? Yes. 